know I started talk about Ceresna. I never got to it, but I put it up on the board. And we'll be talking about that. Uh, look, uh, I talked to a few people, and I don't want you to get the impression, maybe I am giving you that impression, I'll probably fall asleep maybe to it, that Wilson uh, alone changed the course of history by his uh, being just being Wilson, but I do want to say that I, I had this discussion. There were a confluence of events. I, I've always had this belief that there is a combination of a human being and forces of history working together. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the man alone created the created or but he had some influence he had some being the personality of a person could have an influence free will has an influence forces outside a human being can uh, certainly control that human being but the human being also has an ability to to alter the course of of, of, of events as well as the forces, impersonal forces that are moving. And maybe I'm putting too much emphasis on Wilson's personality and not enough on the other forces. But uh, I'm one of those people that do believe that, 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 that although there were other forces, forces out there, and I'm not saying that Wilson was such a great man, but the position, but he did it all through events. Not necessarily because he was a great man, but because of the fact that he was in the position where he was, and his personality and his background was such that it affected events around him. Whereas another man or another woman would not have affected those events because of his, another person's personality. And what may be considered a limitation in Wilson to a lot of people was also to other people a strength. I, I brought up I brought up the fact we had uh, we had uh, we have you know we, we there there's a lot of people out there after Wilson after World War II who have taken the position uh, during World War II but not during World War One at least not with Wilson even though it was out there of a social Darwinist, a Darwinian world, where forces combine together and a material force controls a lot of the events. And there was a lot of people that have a social Darwinist that came out after, after the disillusionment of the Depression, you know, of the world of the 1920s. There was exposure to social Darwinism when Wilson was president. But Wilson never really absorbed it. He was a romantic in his thinking. And although it was out there, he was a bright guy. He didn't absorb it. He was one of these people, the age of, 19, of, of Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, was this age was also an age of William James and progressivism and the idea that human beings can make a better world. Human beings are not animals that are controlled. They are unique. Spiritual force, God controls them. And that Although there's evil out there, we can overcome that evil through banding together. That concept still exists today. It's always out there. Wilson was one of these people that believed that humans can control their own destinies. That humans can be idealists and be practical at the same time. Now, most of us now don't feel that way. Realistically, we don't feel 
we feel that we've seen the Nazi persecution and that there is something inherently evil in people, in the people. I mean, we're always looking for better, but we are more, because of what happened in World War II, we're more aware of it. Now, Wilson was living in the United States. He was living, he had seen the ravages of civil war. In the, he grew up in the South. But he was, grew up in Princeton, and his, he was an idealist who was a Presbyterian. His father was a Presbyterian preacher. And he adopted the attitude, you are romantic, you, we can improve the world. And there was the major in philosophy at that time, in 1910, 1920, was that we can improve the world. There was William James progressivism, which is that you go to school, you get educated, you, you, you can actually overcome we are different from animals. And that a person like Wilson was not, a, was not cynical. He, he was aware that probably there would be a major disappointment in his belief if, if he sought out peace, the world would maybe become disappointed. But he still believed it would happen. He was one of these people, maybe the last, maybe one of the last. Yes. Well, he's so idealistic. Why did he uh, believe in racial segregation then? Why was he so prejudiced against black people? Good question. I didn't say he was such a great man. <laughs> did I, I didn't say he was a great man. I said he believed in the perfection of man. <coughs> he himself. He was an idealist, he said. He was an idealist in the sense that what I'm talking about is not whether he was a great man or whether he had racial prejudices. I'm talking about the concept that man can improve. That's a big difference. A theoretical thing. A theory. That man can get better. Even though he himself had those feelings of racism, as you say, prejudices, he still felt there was a better part of nature that can come about if people are educated, learn, and that the people can stop wars. Stop wars by just simply getting the right leaders in and working on it, and that there is nothing organic to stop the perfection of get the, not the, not the, the improvement, not the perfection, the improvement of man to prevent wars. It's a big difference. He can't be precious. He was, we, we, he was, he was, in my opinion, he was not a cynical man. In my opinion, and most people's opinion, he believed what he said. He wouldn't have gone out of his way to actually die eventually from fatigue if he didn't believe what he said. He was one of these people that had previously worked three or four hours a day while he was the beginning of his presidency. And the last three years, all he would do was work for 18, 19 hours a day. He wouldn't get any sleep because he was committed. Committed to making humans better. But he was a narrow-minded person. I'm not talking about how great he was or what a great guy he was. I'm talking about his beliefs that led the nation. And I'm talking about the fact that he was put in a position where he could, these things could come out. Where, where he, um, did I get where he, where he could be a Mr. Chips, as you said. Somebody who really didn't know the world around him, but thought that he did, and that people could be better, and that wars could end. And it got to a point where all he cared about, he didn't care about the labor unrest, he didn't care about the Alien Sedition Acts. The, the Constitution didn't mean much to him anymore. I don't know if you're aware of it. In 1917, when the war was going on in World War I, the U.S. passed laws that broke up the Constitution and arrested people. 
who has had any disagreement with world, who dis, anyone who disagreed with World War One could be put in jail, and Wilson was supporting it. Wilson's mind was not on that. Wilson's mind was on the unity. It was about the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. What? It was about the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, and they, they were concerned about they had, they had first one of the red, their rounds of Red Scare, and, and they were concerned about the influence that they might have on all those areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but yeah, the Bolsheviks, yes, definitely. But what I'm trying to say is that he was brought up in the 19th century of ideals, of the British sort of ideals, that we can get better. He didn't believe that that uh, he didn't. He believed that 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 we can work on things. He did believe in that. And that attitude made him wrongly predict that he could control the United States government. Because one of the things he was a victim of, or a, was the fact he was a casualty of adoration and adulation. As I said last week, whether we accept, whether whatever, it was him. He was considered a Christ-like figure when he, when he announced that. And it wasn't that he was so great. It's just that if somebody believes, if, you see, if, you, if you're in a position, you're in the United States, you bring all, and, and the soldiers of America <laughs> believed in them. They believed in a noble cause. Because Wilson said it's a noble cause. And they were going over to Europe, and they were dying over there, but they weren't dying over a very long period of time. <coughs> so the European soldiers, the European people, look to the American soldier. It's different. He's going to bring victory to us. He's going to end this war. The soldiers are going to bring victory to us. And the leader of these soldiers is Woodrow Wilson. And he's going to bring victory to us. And then when Woodrow Wilson got up, and said, after the victories of the soldiers and all the dying that had gone on, and remember the army, the World War I was fought without the soldiers for three years. There was a war weariness. More, as I said last week, more people were killed in World War I than they were in World War II. They were dying to end the war, but they couldn't find a way out. And as Will said, who wasn't even interested in foreign policy until 1915, and suddenly he got absorbed with it, and that's all he could think about. He couldn't think of anything domestically. Now what is he doing? He, I, I didn't tell the, I maybe mean, I didn't spell it out. The Lusitania was a sinking of a ship. That didn't occur late in the war. That occurred in 1915, a year and a half after, I think a year and a half. Sinking of an American ship. But we didn't go to war right away. But. Over time, things like, I think it was the Lusitania was, 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 oh, was a British ship, wasn't it? That was a British ship. Oh, was a British ship. But there were ships American that, citizens. Yeah, that, if somebody wants to talk more about the naval, I'll be glad to. to you want to bring something up, Glenn, about no, no, no. it? It's just a fact. Because I don't, I'm not. It was considered to be a but, but, but what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that because he got imbued with ending the war, later in the war, he was able, the country was behind him. The country was behind him. They weren't willing to go to war too. And he was able to have a war declared in 1917, early 1917. But the war ended in, in the 1918. We weren't there only a year and a half. And we mobilized and we brought all the soldiers at a time when we were looking for the journey. Our world, the world, European war world, was looking for an end to the war, and we brought we brought victories in many ways to the to the the front, and Wilson took credit for that, and the soldiers took believed in Wilson, and the government, the American people believed in Wilson, but the war ended in November 11th, and why did it basically end it? And I really do believe it's because Wilson was lucky. Or, or because he, he wasn't scheming, he was just lucky. He basically said we should treat the vanquished like the victors. We have to end all wars. 
we don't, we can't, we have to stop the war. And the Germans, who were losing the war, now say we have a reason to stop the war, because we, if we didn't have Wilson making these announcements, how will we continue? We'd have to continue fighting. But here's an opportunity, a way out of this war, because Wilson is giving us the opportunity and telling the, the victors, the, the French, the French, and the British, don't beat them up. You got to live with these people afterwards. You want to have another war 30 years later? Like you had in 1870 was a war, the war between France. You want another French-German war in 1870, now you want to do it all over again? So basically, Wilson was telling France and Germany, who also wanted to end the war, but wanted to, you got to hold back. And the timing of Wilson to say this worked. Germany and Austria basically said, let's lay down our arms because Wilson's leading the way out. Wilson really believed he was ending all wars, but he did succeed, even if he didn't succeed in ending all wars because he didn't know, you know, he was not a realistic person. But the people believed him, and they were willing to find a practical way to end World War I. I know, and the ending of World War I, in spite of what you say, influences have all these forces outside of one man, but this one man did have an effect on ending that war so abruptly in November of 19, uh, 1918. And that's why we celebrate Armistice Day so much, because it was an abrupt break with war. Now, two weeks before that, on the election of the Congress in the United States, the Republicans, what his party, did not get him his support. Wilson should have realized, maybe he could because the whole world was looking to Wilson, and Wilson was still adored in many ways in the United States by most of the people. But in 1918, they made a rebuff to him. They said to him, wait a minute, why don't you worry about domestic problems? And even though they knew the war was about to end because November 11 came about only a week later, and the Wilson should have gotten a lot. His, he couldn't get the Congress, he could get the, he got the Congress, the, the people that were against Wilson, Henry Cabot Lodge, these other people, got a majority in the state senate. Well, isn't there more, I think, for the way I read it, there was more resistance to Wilson than you're making out. Clemenceau said that uh, uh, Moses had the Ten Commandments and Wilson's got 14. I mean, yeah. did they, they want to oh. punish Germany, they didn't want to stop. I forgot your first name, what's your name? Michael. 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 I am emphasizing that he, you know, there, there was a lot of people that didn't like Wilson. He was considered to be, you know, a preacher. Uh, a hippie. Uh, to, to some, yes. Well, I, yes, there were people that considered him a hypocrite. I didn't consider him a hypocrite, but other people consider him a hypocrite. Maybe you consider him. I consider a situation where whether you consider him a hypocrite or not, he, he, he espoused personal beliefs that people, that people were very much for or very much against, but there was a lot of support at the time for president. Yes, there always is going to be when you have leaders, you're going to have people that are he going was, to disagree. I, if you, he, he was against the war so much and everything. What? I, if he was against the war so much, then, then why he send troops into Russia when the, you know, when the Russian people got out of the war before anybody else did? They ended the war, as far as they were concerned, they got out of it. You know? They made troops well, peace with the Germans. Okay, okay but, but he was, he basically believed in, what, in the concept that, that people can and all was. He, he was doing that, okay? He was doing that. There was, there was, there was still a conversation. You could, you could measure, you could go back and measure why he did what he did. But I'm trying now, I'm trying now, he believed he had the support of the American people, most of the support of the American people, when he ended, when he, when he tried the League of Nations. He wasn't going on a wild goose chase. He really, he went out of his way. He believed in it. Okay, so yes, there was dissension. Okay, but I'm making out. I'm, make, I'm indicating that there was basically a, a belief in him, a, a strong belief in him, 
And he thought he was basically somebody that was there for God, you know, that God was giving him the way to find a way to, and he put himself in that position and he was, and the people of the world in, in 1918, November of 1918 started to believe in him, believed in him. He was considered to be in many ways, and he probably was. He had more people. He traveled to, after he got the word that he didn't get the support of the Congress, he said, that's a nip in the bud. I will accept that, and I will go over to Europe, and I will talk to the backwards, the, the, the forces that fought there, and do what I can to, uh, to end to, to, now that the war has stopped, to create a better society. Because what's going to happen? We have to settle the problems of Europe. Otherwise, we may have another conflagration. So we traveled by boat on George Washington on December 4th, 1918. The armistice was signed November 11th, and he went off to Europe. He was on a boat, a, a, a destroyer, a, 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 I mean a battleship. And uh, there were 21 destroyers and battleships that went into France, to Br Brest, France. And he went in to Brest, France. And more people were lined up in France than has ever been seen up to that time. I'm talking about France. He went in there, he was treated like a god. He was treated by everyone. He sort of, there, were, there, was, there was such a large number of people stretched out to see Wilson. And he was considered to be, even by the Germans, the Russians, Wilson, Wilson, he was considered to be put in a position. He was put in a position where he was considered to be a Christ-like figure to these people of France, to these people of Europe, who looked at him as a man that would end, that had brought about the end of this war, that brought about the end of this destruction. And they looked to a human being and said, wrongfully, maybe, but right, they looked at Wilson as the man that said they'd stop the war. Now, can you believe if you have people believing that, and millions and millions of them? More people were there in Paris than there ever was in the history of the world in Paris. It was like, Bethlehem, like Jesus was being born, and the, the angels were coming down. Everybody, there was, you couldn't move in Paris. Millions and millions of people came to see Wilson. He was treated like a god. He saw the Clemenco, the, the prime minister, he saw Poincare, the president. He was treated like a god. And then, they, each one of these boats, I mean, when it came into each one of these boats gave him a 21 gun salute. And, he, uh, and there were about 19 of them. Then he went to Paris. Then, then he was treated royally for two weeks. And he decided he was going to make his headquarters in Paris. He had one, he didn't, have, he didn't bring a, content, a group of people to work with him. He basically went by himself. He had a, two or three, four people. France had, had delegations. Germany had, they had 20, 30 people from each delegation. He was the one spokesman for the world was saying, you can't, you have to have, you can't get everything you want. You can't have Germany get everything it wants. You can't have France get everything you want. And he was basically himself alone. Consulted. He refused to bring aids. He had them, but he felt he was aware. He was emulated, or whatever. He was maybe falsely thought himself to be really God speaking to him, and he didn't have to consult with his own friends because you know none of the other leaders, France, Germany. And when he declared the end of the war, we're well, with him. He spoke out alone. And he got this conception that he could work alone on solving the problems. Crazy. But 
that's the way it was. And the, Europe treated him like a god for the first couple of weeks because he had brought an end to the war. But then, you know, if you're Europe, if you're England, you're Germany, you're France, you're fighting for people. You start a war and you do it. I mean, you, you're in a war and people, your, your son dies, your grandson dies, your father dies. You're going to not be detached. <coughs> you're going to say, I fought this war, not to end all wars. I fought this war because I want to get Alsace back. I, my son died to get Alsace Lorraine. Or I want to, Italy, I, 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 I want to have, I want to have this territory. Wilson's attitude, the only reason Wilson was brought into the picture was different. And it lasted for, it ended the war permanently. But it created a false impression in his mind that everybody thought the same way he did. And nobody really thought the same way he did. Very few. I mean, most people weren't idealists. But he was put in there, and, you know, he basically said, you know, England, he was telling England, freedom of the seas. Do you think England would want freedom of the seas? What was England based on? A navy. You know? So, trying to say he had, if he looked at it detachedly, if he looked at it objectively, he would have been doomed to many ways to not getting his way. And, but in the beginning, he was the highest figure in the world. He was the savior. But then he sat down and he started negotiating. And people didn't have the generosity because they were more unattached than he was, detached. I mean, he was they were more attached than he was. And they started to disagree with him. But he basically worked alone. And now he's working 18 hours a day. He's going from one conference to another conference to another conference. And they're following him around, you know, delegations. And they finally, they look at him and they think of him not as the strongest picture person anymore. He's starting to diminish. He's starting in, in their eyes. He's starting to lose stature in their eyes. He's <coughs> taking different principles from what the children fought for. But the one thing that he's espousing is a League of Nations. He's saying, you know, he has 14 points, and the last point is the League of Nations. He's basically saying, if you have a problem, we can have a league. And I had indicated last week that if he said he was probably right, he said that if World War I, before World War I, there had been a League of Nations, Germany probably wouldn't have gone to war. Can't guarantee that. And if Germany didn't go to war, the rest of the world wouldn't have gone to war. And there wouldn't have been, if there had been a League of Nations, there wouldn't have been World War I. He's probably right. Because the times, at that time, in 1914, there was a league. I mean, there was no league. And countries were banding together against other countries. And if you had one tripwire in one country, you could lead. You had an alliance that somebody else would come in and protect and work with you. And there were cross purposes. So you had alliances of two split, you know, the Axis forces and the alliance. And it wouldn't have happened maybe if there had been a lead. That's what Wilson said. And most people believe that he's probably right. But they also realized, many people did, that you really can't stop world wars. But in his, but he wasn't thinking of theory. He was thinking about what happened in 1914, and now he's in 1918, and he's saying, "Look what happened. If we had an alliance, if we had a uh, not alliance, if we had a league, 
to stop alliances, we would have been able to stop not, uh, World War One. And he said, May, and if that's the case, maybe we'd be able to stop another war, which will probably happen in 25 or 30 years, and we don't have a league. Uh, now, war mobilization plays a big role in world, in, towards World War I, and you've made out in, in, your, uh, in your lectures about, about the war. Uh, the, you know, the Russians and, the, and, and one railroad running from, from Siberia to, 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 to the front, and they had to bring all these soldiers up. And if, he, if they couldn't bring them up in time, they would lose terribly. Uh, the Germans, they had uh, uh, the same problem with, with bringing troops up fast enough so they could maintain a front. And they, 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 with the, 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 the political leaders, you know, not the civilian political leaders, not the military, uh, had to listen to the military and to, you know, telling them that if you're going to fight this war, you've got to get the troops up right now, mm -hmm. otherwise we're going to suffer terribly. Right. And the, the war took place pretty much because of war. The whole concept of war mobilization and bringing in troops. And uh, they didn't have uh, uh, tanks and they didn't have yeah, like, but I'm not trucks. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I know that. The war went on and on. I know that. I know Russia wasn't uh, mon uh, didn't have the armament, didn't have the railroads. I know that. They had the men, but didn't have the railroads. And, but we're not talking about that. I also think that you making I think Europe was caught up in the crucible of the moment. When you say that they had a forethought, they were thinking, well, if you do this now, they won't have a war. They weren't even thinking about that. That that is only in retrospect that you're able to look back and say and look at both events of World War I, World War II, and said if you hadn't done that, then you wouldn't have a World War II. When they're involved with these negotiations, they, say that. they had no concept that right. oh, if we don't do this now, we have to worry about right. World War II. I, I, I know that. Maybe I'm not getting my point right. across. I'm not saying that there would not have been a World War II. That's only retrospect that you have that, that view. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm saying what could, what the arguments that were made, and I don't know what, and I don't believe, as I said before, I don't believe World War II if there had been a league, there would have not been World War II. A lot of, the, a lot of World War II would but be, I, is, about, is about the financial, the, re, the, the reparations that France and Britain decided to determine that they had to have money because of the total destruction that was enacted. And that, that again, the perfect confluence that fed into the fact that there was a worldwide depression caused Germany to go you know, with the Weimar Republic. And in that whole, that's when that gave the excuse. OK, OK, so now let me get back. I, Okay, thank you. I, I want to talk about what was going on in his mind in, what, in 1918 and what was going on in the mind of the people in 1918 and how they were disillusioned by him. And what could have happened or would have happened, we don't know. Because we're not, we can't ever go back into history and pull it back and say, but there were complications. Wilson was, was put in a position where he thought he could end all wars. And people believed in him to a certain extent, and other people did not believe in him. But by, by the time, by the time he went to, he had he had been working very long, and he had not his stature had started to diminish, and he's working 18 hours a day. And what's going on? He suddenly gets very sick in April. He's there from November. To February, in, the, in, in, in France, from November, I mean December fourth, he goes over. This is, I'm sorry, November eleventh, December fourth, he goes over. December thirteenth, he arrives. He's analyzed. He goes to France. He goes to he goes to he goes to uh, England. He goes to Italy. He is treated like a god in Italy. The Pope comes up. Everybody is treating him like a Christ-like figure. He's treated, more people came together in Rome than there had ever been in Rome. Not even Armistice Day was as big as when Wilson arrived in Rome. He's treated like a god, so maybe, as I said, well, this, this, this attitude and be using him that maybe I can be like a god. And then he gets to a position where he feels that he alone, can, because he's detached and they are not, he alone can work out the problems of the world. Yes, ma'am. What about all the money involved? We, 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 bankrupt, we, we bankrupt bankrupt countries during the war, England, 
France. France. We, 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 right. we, they asked the little war, they were screaming that we were Uncle Shylock, we're putting right. screws to them right. for the money. Right, right. I know. I said that. I mean, I'm saying that with this illusion. Okay, so now, now, he's working. He's working. He goes back to the United States, he does some work in February, he takes it, and he goes back for a couple of days only. He's on the United States. Meanwhile, the United States is a all this unrest is going on in the United States. So many veterans can't find jobs. Of course, the living is skyrocketing in the United States. We are, there's strikes. Half a million people, coal miners, go out on strike. They need a leader in the United States. He decides to leave. Doesn't do anything about it. Goes back, he's got a mission. He's one-sided. He's only thinking about one thing, getting the wars, conflicts over in Europe, and creating a league. But he goes back, and he's working. He's working 18 hours a day, but he's working on only one thing. He's working maybe two hours a day in the morning on domestic affairs, things that were sent over. But he's in Europe. He's not in the United States. People say, where is this president? Not here. He's over there. And he's working. And he's doing a lot. I have to say, he was, he was brilliant in his dividing up the territories. He handled about 200, 200 territorial problems in Europe. He was considered, but his stature starting to diminish, starting to diminish in Europe. And in April, he starts to get suspicious of the British, George, Clementor. He's working late at night. He suffers a temperature of 103 on April 3rd, 1919, in Paris. And it looks like he's going maybe to die. His, his doctor, who is with him all the time, Dr. Grayson, his best friend, diagnosed his condition. Because of all the 1919, everybody was suffering from pneumonia and influenza. It looked like he had influenza. And they didn't know whether he was going to make it. April 3rd, 1919, he's 103, he's got influenza. Doctor diagnoses his influenza. Was it influenza? Or was it influenza? Anyway, he slowly recovers. As he gets out of his recovery on April 6th, he, three days he can't play, he's, in, he's in April 6th, April 7th, he gets up out and he says, bring in Clement Carr, the <coughs> French, the British, George. If they don't come to me, I'm going home. They got to start compromising more than what they have. So they come to him. Now they rush in because he's what he's getting tough with them for the first time. He says he's walking home. He's going back to the United States. Right after he comes out of the sick bed, he starts treating them very suspiciously. Very suspiciously. And they kowtow to him. They give him things because they think he's really going to carry out his threat. He decides. They're kowtowing to me. They're agreeing to these things. I'll stick around. But his attitude towards everybody around him, except his wife, changes. Whereas there, before he was believing in the people he was talking to and had this good attitude, now he's suspicious of everybody. He has a, a, his best aide out there, is Edward House. He thinks House is trying to undermine him. He's trying to he thinks the servants are all spies. All the servants that are working for him are spies, listening in. All of a sudden, I don't know where he starts thinking this. Thing. Is it true that he had syphilis? Hmm? Is it true that he had syphilis? No. No, I mean, hmm. we, no, we didn't. They, they just, no way. <laughs> all right? But, you know, that happens from me. They rumored that. They rumored that. But is it true? I don't think so. 99% sure, no. I see you're a very skeptical person. <laughs> you're skeptical of everything I about. <laughs> but, you know, hold back for a little bit. Maybe there's some good in them. Uh, there, 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 there is, uh, there is uh, an attitude that he can't trust anybody. And now, he gets disillusioned, but his ideal is still the world, the um, the uh, beauty of getting a league of nations. So 
So Memorial Day comes along. Okay? Ceresis, I finally got to. Ceresis. And I want you to read to you. He's, what does he do? Ceresis was a battlefield where American GIs were killed and buried in France, similar to what happened in Gettysburg, in France. And to many people, this was equivalent to the Gettysburg Address. So I just want to read to you. In this, he never waited about the League and international justice. He talked about it on Memorial Day of 1919, on May 30th, when he went to the American Army graveyard at Ceresnes to speak over the dead boys. Now, this is Memorial Day. This is right after Armistice Day. GIs had died, and they had been buried in Ceresnes. And all these European men are dying in Ceresnes. All right, and this is what he says. To the world, is still a, the people of France are still looking to him as a savior. Not the leaders, but the people are still looking to Wilson. And he's in this acacia grove on a hillside in Ceresnes, France. And he says, So it has a duty to take and maintain the safeguards which, which will see to it that the mothers of America and the mothers of France and England and Italy and Belgium and all the other suffering nations should never be called upon for the sacrifice again. This can be done. It must be done. And it will be done. The great thing that these men left, up, left us is the great instrument of the League of Nations. If we do not know courage, we cannot accomplish our purpose. And this age is an age that looks forward not backward, which rejects the standard of national selfishness that once governed the councils of nations and demands that we shall give way to a new order of things in which the only questions will be, is it right? Is it just? It is in the interest of mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, we all believe, I hope the spirits of these men are not buried with their bones. Their spirits live. I hope, I believe that the spirits are present with us at this hour. I hope that I feel the compulsion of their presence. I hope that I realize the significance of their presence. Think, soldiers, of these comrades of yours who are gone. There were 36,000 French soldiers there. <coughs> Think, soldiers, of these comrades of yours who are gone. If they are here, what would they say? They would remember America. They would remember the terrible field of battle. They would remember what they had come for. He's talking about the American GIs who died. They would remember what they had come for. See, they died believing in them. We command you in the names of those who, like ourselves, have died to bring the councils of men together, and we remind you what America said she was born for. She was born she said, to show mankind the way to liberty. She was born to show men the way of experience by which they might realize this gift and maintain it. Make yourself soldiers once and for all in this common cause. Wear no uniform except the uniform of the heart, clothing ourselves with the principles of right, and saying to men everywhere, you are our brothers and we invite you into the comradeship of liberty and peace. If I may speak a personal word, and this is what, why you have to at least forgive Wilson something. This is what he believes, because he follows his life this way after this. If I may speak a personal word, I beg you to realize the compulsion that I myself feel I am under. By the constitution of our great country, I was the commander in chief of these men. I advised the Congress to declare that a state of war existed. I sent these lads over here to die. Shall I, can I ever speak a word of counsel which is inconsistent with the assurance I gave them when they came over? 
There is something better, if possible, that a man can give than his life, and that is his living spirit to a service that is not easy. To resist counsels that are hard to resist. To stand against purposes that are difficult to stand against. To say, here I stand, consecrated the spirit of the men who were once my comrades and who are now gone, and he left me on the eternal bonds of fidelity. To the people that were listening, this was the greatest speech they had ever heard. He had actually said, even Lincoln didn't even say it. Though he did it, he felt it the same way Wilson did, but he didn't say it. I am responsible for their deaths. How many people say that? I am responsible for their deaths, and I have to carry on knowing that I caused their deaths, and I must make the fact that they died for a cause my cause. And then he went home. And now the league had been agreed to, but they needed the support of Congress. But Congress wasn't interested. And many of the American people weren't interested in what he was saying in Sir Esnes, France. But he was now, through his words, committed. Because how could he now, in his mind, this is how he felt, if there was a chance that there could be an end that he could do this, and these people didn't, he's got himself committed to the people that died, and he tells he's responsible for their deaths. So he goes to Congress to get a League of Nations, and he addresses Congress on July 10th. He comes back by ship and addresses Congress. On July 10th, 1919, and you think that the Congress would support him? Two senators refused to stand when he walks into the two senators. But that was majority. We're giving him, they looked at him, not like the people of Europe did. They looked at him, many of them now were turned on him. Because the, while he was away, the, the United States was falling apart domestically. I told you about the cold, there was no control. His mind was one-sided. All he could think about was the League of Nations and the people and his commitment that they died and I have to stop all wars. They thought, many of them did, that this is an arrogant man, a school teacher looking at the Congress, as bad students, he was lecturing them. Remember, he didn't have any people in Europe to negotiate with. He didn't have any Republicans go to, to, to Europe with him, even though they had helped fight the war with him. He was arrogant. He distrust. But remember I told you as of April 3rd, he was suspicious of everybody? Continue that way. Continue that way. He's had two friends, Tumulti, three friends, Tumulti, uh, Joseph Tumulti is the guy who worked with him uh, in, in New Jersey, and, and, uh, and his doctor, Edwin Grace, he didn't have anybody else, and his wife, and his wife, and they looked, at, but that's, that, that was his inner circle. He didn't consult with anybody. He demanded a rubber stamp, Congress, to rubber stamp the League of Nations. Lodge was the Republican leader. He was a Brahmin from, uh, he was a uppity up guy from uh, Massachusetts, I think. And he, uh, he was the leader of the Republican Party. And remember, they were majority in the Senate because of what happened in the election. And they opened fire, the Congress. Uh, they, it's a Pandora's box of evil, they said, if we join the League of Nations. Why? We have been here. And maybe rightly so, they had this right to think that. We have been here for 200 years. We never got involved in a war, in World War, in the people of Europe. 
Why do you think we are what we are? Because we stayed away. We left, we stayed out of Europe. Why should we get into Europe and have our sovereignty as the U.S.? This President Wilson is telling us to give up our sovereignty, to be able to a world where he's the world leader. But what about the United States? Are we going to go every time there's a dispute in Germany, every time there's a dispute in France, every spot time there's a dispute in Italy, and a league says they shouldn't do what they did and we, now we have to enforce it? We're going to go over there? Where's our independence? Where's our sovereignty? Wilson is taking away our sovereignty. And maybe they had an argument. Maybe they were right. But law, and, but the thing is that Lodge and Teddy Roosevelt, who had died while he was in Europe, hated Wilson. He thought that Wilson, and who was his best friend? Lodge. Lodge never hated a man as much as he hated Wilson. Teddy Roosevelt thought that Wilson was a hypocrite. And somebody said that. Uh, whatever. Whatever. They, well, that, Wilson, uh, that Wilson is going to give up the American sovereignty. Remember, his son, Teddy Roosevelt's son, died in World War I. He was a patriot, but he didn't want us to go into Europe. Well, Roosevelt, like, you know, like Wilson wanted him to, to go whenever there's a league problem. We need our independence, Lord. And Lodge put reservations and on Wilson to say, you can't go into the League of Nations. And why, what Wilson said, if I have reservations, what about all the other hundred countries? They also going to have reservations? Everyone's going to have reservations? We will never have a League. It was all black or white to Wilson. You had to rubber stamp them. Now, the country was starting to turn against Wilson because of the domestic problems, the strife. The, uh, the, there were so many problems that Wilson was not addressing because he was involved in this. Uh, and they said, you know, he's like an Alice in Wonderland. What is he, the Mad Hatter? You know, he's talking about things that don't concern us. <clears throat> anyway, Wilson and Lodge could Wilson and Lodge could talk to one another, and they did it publicly. Wilson refused to get up on a podium when Lodge was around. So I can't I can't even see the man. I refuse to talk to him. And he's the president of the you know he's the leader of the Congress, of the Senate. And what happened is, Wilson decides that the only way, because now the majority of Congress has said they're voting it down, and he talks to people, finally Wilson talks to people, and they said, there's no way you can get this league passed. He talks to Democrats, and they said, you can't get this league. He talks to this governor of Indiana, Watson, and he says, you can't, you've got to, you've got to uh, give in to Lodge's reservations. And it's for the good of the country. Well, this says, no, I can't do that. If I do that, the league will fall apart. Because other, every other country will do the same thing. So what does he decide to do? He decides to go on a railroad trip out west to bludgeon, in his words, to bludgeon Congress into accepting the fact that the people want to join the league. And if he goes out west, he makes, goes to railway stops, and he gets the support of the American people at the railway stops, Congress will finally accept the fact that the American people, the American people, are supporting the League. Should have known. The people were telling him, the people who were consulting with him when he listened to them, was that they weren't supporting him. But he closed his eyes. And you remember, he had this ability to believe that Things will go his way. Look what happened in Europe then. And the same thing will happen in America. And there was, there wasn't these big riots going on against Wilson. There might have been riots, but they weren't going. They weren't, they weren't, you know, like in the Vietnam War. So he tells Tumulty and Doctor, I'm going on a whistle.
I mean a, a, a railway train, and I'm going to go out west to, to visit 25, 30 states west of Washington, D.C., and go out west, go to California, Washington, all the states in between, and he gets there. And now, he's not feeling well. I told you. He had not been feeling well. He had been getting his nausea. He had been getting nauseous. He had headaches every day. He had uh, uh, stomach problems. He had asthma. They were all, and now he's looking weary. He's actually aged. There's lines on his face. And now he develops twitch. Not just an eye twitch, a terrible twitch. Half his face goes up in the air and down as he's talking. Every time he talks, he starts to twitch. He's really suffering. And now he's going to go on a railroad trip. And he now is going to spend 17 hours a day on the railroad. He's not taking any time off. And he leaves on September 3rd, and he starts going out west. And the crowds come out to him. Not tremendous crowds. But crowds, good crowds, they still love Wilson. You couldn't tell whether they dislike him or like him, because the people that are out, but they, he was the president that caused them to go into war, and he was, in many ways, still loved. But he gets, he gets to, on his return trip, he is now going in from how much time do I have? Two minutes? Three minutes. He, he's on his return trip, on his return trip from California to Washington, the state of Washington. And now, he's now going for Utah, and now he's Wyoming, and now he's going into Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado. And he gets up in front of a crowd, and he can hardly move. His left side is hot. He's walking, and he's stumbling up to the stairway. Now, 15,000 people are waiting. And he starts to talk about the boys who died in France. And then he starts to cry. Ball! Cry out! Why did that? They died, they died. Why did they? And the whole, he sort of, one or two tears before he started crying. He couldn't continue. He cried for, like crazy. He goes home, I mean, he goes back, and his wife says, I think we have to stop this trip. Goes into a compartment at 11:30 on September 3rd. I'm, I'm sorry, September 27th. The yeah, September 3rd was the start of the trip. September 27th, and he's in the compartment trying to sleep, and all of a sudden he calls out for his wife, Edith, come, and he can't get up out of the bed, and he suffered. He, they call the doctor who's there. They find out. Can't move his left side of his body. He refuses to give up. Can't can't get up. Can't move his left. He refuses to quit. He got to quit. His wife puts her foot down. And says, "You're going home." If he says, "I can't go home," the will say, "I'm a quitter." And what about those people that died that I did? You're going home. He gets he gets into the train and. And uh, he starts thinking, and he's seeing people. He starts waving to people that aren't there. Okay, so I, I, I think my friend is telling me. <laughs> Continue next week. Yeah, <laughs> 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 There's no question next week? No.